is Tom Steiner. I uh, came all the way from Hamburg, Germany, which is pretty far from here. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've worked at Google in Hamburg since uh, about 2005, when I was an intern. Um, then I was uh, studying in France for a bit. Um, I was a temporary contractor with Google Paris uh, back then. Um, then I was an intern in uh, the monthly headquarters. I have uh, been around for a bit, um, yeah, but then finally I ended up working uh, as a full-time uh, employee in the Hamburg office, and um, yeah, did some research on the topic that I'm presenting today. Um, I should say I'm also uh, a PhD student in a university in Barcelona, Spain, which keeps confusing people because it's yet another, yet another location. Um, so I'm a remote student there. Um, I live and work in Hamburg, so don't get confused if uh, my affiliation seems to say Barcelona, I'm a remote student. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about um, my thesis topic also, so uh, this is why I chose this very long, very descriptive title. Uh, let's read it together and try to parse it. <laughs> Enriching unstructured media content. So I tried to get the line breaks right. So about events to enable semi-automated, and then what? Summaries, compilations, and improved search, the leveraging social networks. So uh, a lot of interesting things in there, at least uh, if you're uh, semantic, uh, yeah, and social geek like I am. Um, so let's get started. What are events? Events happen all the time. This meetup today is an event. Um, it's a planned event. You have all your uh, email alerts and uh, your calendar entries and. Uh, Everybody knew that it was happening today, and you RSVP, you came, you're here. So this is sort of a planned event, just like uh, the Semtech conference um, that happened the last couple of days. Um, but then there's things like this tornado in Oklahoma. So probably um, it was way bigger news in this country than in my country, but it made it into our national news as well, because it was a terrible event, right? Um, so this is very much unplanned, of course. Um, but still, um, if events happen, people go to their favorite social media networks um, and share photos and images about um, yeah, these events. And um, yeah, as I said, events can be planned or unplanned. Um, another, another event can also be the Arab Spring. So you cannot really tell when it started, you cannot really tell when it stopped. It's just like something that happened in point, um, at, at any point in time, and uh, you kind of can associate media content with it. So what, what I'm basically saying is, um, when I'm saying event, I have a very open event definition. So it's not like uh, a concert. It can also be a concert where you have a fixed um, you know, start date, end date, and so on, end time, and so on. Um, but yeah, also with these very vaguely defined events. Um, but yeah, that's the main messaging event for me is very uh, flexible. Um, and then, most probably, if you're, social on, uh, if you're active on any social network, you may have seen this picture. Um, who has seen this picture before? OK, so a couple of people here. Um, so this is from um, the Pope election in 2013 and 2005. That's not the whole truth. If you want to know the whole truth, read this Washington Post story. Um, so it was shared with this impression that people thought, well, okay, this is 2005, everyone listening and like no one taking pictures and anything. And then 2013, fast forward, um, people not holding candles, no, people holding up their uh, mobile phones and, uh, and uh, smartphones and uh, in this case, even someone dorky holding up an iPad. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but the thing is, what this image tries to convey is, um, our perception of events has changed. Um, now we try to record every moment. Um, but this story tells you, if you read it, this was at a funeral. <laughs> this, um, so it was some funeral procession, not the Pope, but I don't know. Um, so this was a sad thing. So people tend to behave, at least uh, in Italy. And uh, here, um, yeah, it was a happy event, the re-election of the new Pope. So, but still, the basic tendency is true. If you look at this image, this one is not fake, actually. This is from the 1990s, this is from the 2010s. Um, people go to concerts, and um, 
they no longer live to the moment, they record the moment, right? So um, here the fans were just enthusiastic, and here everyone is like, I have to hold my iPad still, because if not, the image is going to be shaky. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is 2010. But you get the overall tendency. Um, mobile devices that are capable of recording things are omnipresent at all sorts of events, which is good, because it gives people like me food for my research. So my research question is, and again, let's read that one together. Can user customizable media galleries that summarize given events be created solely based on textual and multimedia data from social networks? And then the good thing is, if you apply this regular expression, it even fits in a tweet. Um, so this is what um, yeah, my uh, advisor recommended to me. Try to fit your main research question in a, in a tweet. And, uh, I succeeded with uh, by ampersand. Um, but yeah, it fit in a tweet, and he was happy, I was happy. And uh, yeah, you can see zero characters left. <laughs> and, uh, also, I wasn't lying, this is where I come from. Um, okay. All right, so that's my main research, research question. Um, so event summarization in my context um, is based on social network data in the form of multimedia data, like uh, images and videos. And uh, we have, or I have uh, developed an application, so that's kind of the thesis writing you speak in the royal we. Uh, so when I, when I say we, most of the time it's uh, me, but uh, whatever. Uh, so I have uh, developed this application in the context of uh, my research that is capable of generating media galleries, like for this example, um, for the Center conference, and um, that yeah, tries to summarize um, this given event. Um, in the following, um, I will give you a couple of yeah, introductory, intro, introductory slides that show you what you need to do if you want to generate a media gallery. And then, once I've given you the main overview, I will dive into the different uh, steps that are required. So this is really, first, a high-level overview. Um, so, at first, if you want to work with different social networks, you need to have a way to extract multimedia data from social networks. And, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, icons up here, it's really all the um, yeah, important Western, at least, Western social networks. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, Flickr, movie pictures, uh, Twitter, Instagram. So a lot of different social networks. And um, you can see here extracted media items stemming from those different um, social networks. If you're interested in um, how we do that or how I do that, um, look at uh, um, citations that I give here. Yes, please. Um, maybe I'm not genius, <laughs> but I usually heard about Facebook and Twitter. So the first one in the left uh, look like a picture. So what what is that that next to the Facebook? The, the, the Twitter. 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 Sorry, this one. Uh -huh, I never heard of it. Um, that's uh, that's a media hosted platform called Twitter. It also has uh, social networking capabilities. Yeah? I did not know that one. Um, it's used a lot um, on Twitter. Before, at least, Twitter had their own photo sharing capabilities. Um, so, yeah, that's a company called Twitter. Um, same for these guys, movie picture. Um, it is or was also used a lot on Twitter. And then you can still see people who don't want to use Twitter's media hosting but use uh, these sort of platforms. Um, but I will talk a bit about uh, the different platforms later. Um, here are the messages. Um, so if you want to do something with media um, from social networks, you have to retrieve them first. If you want to know how, actually, this is the publication that explains it. Um, and uh, I will circulate the slides around, so don't copy any of this. Um, if you look uh, at my Twitter account, you can get the link to the slides. Um, so later on, at least. Just um, synopsis, do you use the API or do you actually index it? I know, using, using just the public search APIs. So everything I do here is completely public, right? So there's no internal access to any sort of uh, secret data. It's really completely public. Um, all right, so once you have a huge set of, well, it was not huge, but it was big, as you can see here. And once you have a big set of media items, there's typically, at least for very big events, um, like if you think of a, a huge Madonna concert in a huge stadium where millions of people sit and take photos and images and videos and whatever, um, you have to somehow prune the list and you have to select 
the interesting things from the boring things. So um, what we did in the next step is we developed a very aggressive um, new duplicate um, clustering algorithm um, that, yeah, as you can see here, is really very aggressive in the sense of um, it tries to figure out um, similar enough, like visually similar enough media items, um, and then clusters them together. Um, this is both true for videos and uh, photos, and uh, especially in one case, um, if you have photos that are contained in one scene of a video, um, we also try to cluster them and try to detect that. Um, typically, moving images are more interesting to look at than still images, so uh, we kind of try to see if we have a certain photo as a video, we try to feature the, the, the video more. Um, and yeah, again, this is very aggressive by design, sometimes even too aggressive in the sense of uh, maybe a human being wouldn't have clustered these together, but um, typically we really have way too much media, media items so that in the end it doesn't really matter. Um, we just want to have um, the similar ones clustered together. All right. So once you've done that, um, you end up with a couple of clusters of similar media items, as you can see here. So you can see maybe here is a stro stroller, stroller, you're not, or it's a bit uh, behind. Um, these ones seem to be exactly the same. Um, I don't know, here's tiny differences, but if you look at the icons here, this one was from Triptych, this one was from Twitter. So sometimes people share one media item on several social networks or someone uploads a video on YouTube, and then someone else po uh, posts a YouTube video on Facebook. So you can see there's a lot of things that people do with social networks, resharing stuff on different social networks and so on. So um, what I'm interested in is doing something with these clusters of similar media items. And uh, what we did is we uh, developed a ranking formula that tries to somehow rank these different clusters and say, this cluster is actually more important than this one, so we put it up front, and uh, the not so interesting one, we put it below. Um, again, this is explained in the publication, but I will also give you more insights in it. Just at the beginning, I give you the overall uh, story so that you have a feeling of what I'm talking about. Um, okay, and then finally, in the fourth step, um, once you have this set of ranked clusters, um, I'm working on somehow compiling these in what I call media gallery, so that you can see something visual that you can look at very quickly and make sense out of it and say, okay, so this were the highlights of, in this case, the semantic technology and business conference in uh, San Francisco. So the people can really at a glance see, yeah, this is the event. And um, if you're, um, yeah, if you're at a, an event and you come home and your partner asks you, how was it? And you say, good. It's simply what happens, right? Um, <laughs> this is in the future what you could show them. So you can say, hey, wait a minute, there is an app for that. And you show them, this is how it was. It was good, and look here. So it's also very practical to uh, human beings. Um, so these steps, you can see the tiny steps here, were uh, taken from a poster at uh, the that conference in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And again, the references were given here. Um, so this was the overall picture. Extraction from social networks, clustering by similarity, ranking by some social signals and other signals, and, <coughs> sorry, and then finally uh, compiling them together into what we call media gallery. So this is the big picture. So let's dive into a bit because um, this is the semantic web meetup. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, uh, you rank by social by social tags or social I will I will explain later in more detail. Um, if then you still have open questions, feel free to ask them. But um, this is just uh, the overview. Um, so now let's dive into different steps because this is the semantic web meetup, right? So it's not just the multimedia meetup. Um, what is semantic about all this? Um, in the first step, I want to talk about micropost enrichment. Um, so if you think a bit about social networks, social networks kind of connect us with people. That's what they do, that's why they're social. But they do that in very different ways. So if you think of a YouTube video, like uh, from this conference, the social interactions on that network are completely different than the social interactions from that tweet, right? So on YouTube, it's a social network. You can follow people, you can comment on stuff, um, you can follow someone because they have a channel. Um, 
And uh, yeah, you can like, like in this case, video, you can say it's crap, you can download, upload it, you can add comments, um, you can subscribe to this guy's uh, channel. And then on Twitter, you have kind of similar things, you can reply, you can retweet, you can favorite, and so on. Um, so the things you can do on social networks are very similar. The execution, how it looks like, is very different. Um, but what all of them have in common is they have multimedia data, like this and this, and they have textual data, like this and this, and this. So what I'm doing here is, in the first step, I'm enriching this textual metadata. So in this case, the video's title and the video's description, or in this case, the text of the tweet. So this is textual data that I can take and try to make sense out of it. So let's have a look at um, how this works. Um, what we did is we created half of all those social networks, but then try to be the common uh, greatest divisor of all social networks. So all social networks more or less have in common some sort of media. So this is the multimedia on YouTube video, on Twitter an attached, oh, sorry, on Twitter an attached um, image, or even video. So what we do here is we have a media URL that points to something very ugly directly on, in this case, in this example, on YouTube. Just one second, let me finish that. And then we have the post URL, which is a thumbnail for a big image, or which is a still image for a video. Question here. Maybe I missed what you're saying. I'm not familiar with the term micropost. Yeah, so micropost um, is the, in, in uh, the academic, academic world, the term for social network messages. So typically they're very small, so they're not like blog posts, big, typically, they're very small. You can have big messages like on Facebook, but typically they're, in, compared, to, uh, compared to normal blog posts, they are also kind of social, they're smaller. So the term is micropost. It's, yeah, sorry, it's not uh, maybe well, super well known, but um, you can find papers on, on micropost that basically mean that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, just so you could give a couple examples, like, you know, for Twitter, there will be actual tweet, you know, for Facebook image, there will be, like, maybe a like, description for the readers or comments. Exactly, yeah. And for, like, uh, YouTube, there will be, like, also a description. Or yeah. <coughs> so, um, we came up with an abstraction layer on top of all the social networks, on, on top of all those micro posts. And um, this greatest common divisor has all this in common because we look, just look at multimedia data. These two, so some sort of URL, a deep link to the actual media, and some deep link to a small representation, be it a still image for a video, or be it a thumbnail for um, a photo. All right. In the second set, we have here in yellow the textual metadata. So, um, if you think, how can that be? It can be plain text, because in tweets, for example, you just have the tweet, no formatting options at all. If you think Google Plus, for example, um, with some special syntax by adding stars between the words, um, you can have bold face and so on. So, um, on certain social networks, you have HTML, or also. Um, for links, so this is from a tweet, but sometimes if you look at um, a social uh, network micro post from Google Plus, this link would actually be a link in the sense of uh, HTML. So we have both forms here, HTML and plain text. And of course, plain text is a simplification because it removes some of the formatting or some of the uh, links that are contained. And also, if you pay attention, this is um, a hashtag, this is a hashtag in the plain text representation all this gets uh, simplified to just words. Um, all right, and then you have a couple of other terms here. So micro post URL is kind of clear. So this is the deep link to the, in this case, the tweet, to the micro post on Facebook, to the YouTube video, to whatever. Um, and then you have the user profile URL. So in this case, this came from someone called Luca Toledo. So you can see here, Luca Toledo, Stagos, blah. Um, so this is the landing page of that person's profile. Um, type is a video because this person shared, um, uh, yes, you can see it here, so this is a Twitter link that when expanded leads to this URL. So in this case it's a video, timestamp, it's self-explanatory, publication date is human readable, and then interesting here the social interactions, likes, shares, comments, and views. 
Um, I will explain a little bit about that later. Um, for the moment, we just look at this yellow box here, or uh, this yellow, yellow um, text. Um, and then finally, up here, and kind of, I don't even know how to call that uh, color. Is it? I don't even know the German word for that. <laughs> RGB something. <laughs> uh, I think I chose it because it kind of, in my uh, limited view, went well with the other colors. So whatever. So in this color, um, Jason LD. Jason LD, who has heard of Jason LD? Oh, that's cool. Um, so Jason LD um, tries to give this like very flat JSON structure, actual structure in the sense of adding semantics to it. So that when it says here, uh, timestamp, that then people know, okay, it's timestamp in the sense of, say, uh, Dublin Core, or uh, publication date in the, state, uh, in the sense of whatever, uh, or user profile URL in the sense of FOV. So it tries to simply add context, and this is what we do in here. Um, it's not in here because it would just have blasted the slides. Um, but this format, JSON-LD, gives this very flat JSON structure actual semantic meaning. So um, this representation has semantic meaning that is defined in that context in the format of JSON-LD. The good thing is it allows you to still use JSON. So all this is very simple. So developers will be able to directly work with it. But if you are semantic geeks, you can actually have a look at the context and look at the meaning and generate triple season if you like. Um, but for normal web developers, um, it's this very simple structure. OK, so this is simplification um, on top of uh, this very semantic JSON structure. So let's have a look at um, the yellow box now. Um, what we do here is um, we enrich this message by trying to make sense out of it. So um, if you have plain text, like in this, use, in this case, misuse of standardization, that, 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 2013, and DRM, so DRM in the sense of digital rights, rights management, we use a couple of um, named entity extraction and disambiguation services, so namely Open Calais, Alchemy API, Wikipedia Spotlight, Samantha. Um, the interesting thing here is we use all those services in combination. So synergies in the sense of um, all together, they will give more reliability, more, um, more, yeah, more um, precise results than using one of them in isolation. All of them are great, but all of them are great at different things. If we use them together, we can kind of profit from um, the synergies that, that uh, occur here. Um, again, the output is, uh, I've shortened it and simplified it, but you can kind of see what is going on here. So standardization is the name, the label of the concept. But then to add semantic meaning to it, we have an uh, array of URIs. Um, in this case, something pointing to Freebase. And you can see here, standardization is very well defined in Freebase. Um, and we know where that came from. It came from Zamanta. So it came from, in this case from this web service. <coughs> um, the second thing is, DRM, so Digital rights, man rights Management. This time, we have it as a DDPedia concept, so Digital Rights Management in DDPedia, all the underscores are missing. Um, uh, digital Rights Management in, uh, in DDPedia. Um, the source that detected that was Spotlight, so DDPedia Spotlight. Um, and um, in the original output that I've shortened here, um, there were several source uh, sources for different concepts. So. Uh, with a very simple reconciliation um, algorithm, you can then make sense out of uh, all those different annotations and uh, disintegrations and say, um, maybe we want to introduce uh, a minimum relevance. So you can see, for this one, the service is way less sure than for this one. Um, so we could think of all sorts of uh, interesting things like having a threshold, only if it's above a certain threshold, you consider it or not. Um, but basically the message here is, using these different services, we can make semantic sense out of this message. So saying this um, tweet in this case, yeah, it was a tweet, this, th this tweet is about um, these concepts that are well defined in those knowledge bases that you can see here. Is it more services to provide? 
Sorry? What do these four uh, what? services provide? Um, so net entity extraction plus disintegration. So they don't just tell you this is uh, John Doe, the person, which would be net entity extraction, but they also try to make sense out of like what person? Is it John Doe, the John Doe that you know from, uh, I don't know, the movie X? Or is it the John Doe that has, uh, I don't know, a farmer, uh, uh, I don't know, is a farmer next door, right? So, so it's a semantic graph. It's, um, it's basically mapping strings to things, and things are well defined in several knowledge bases, like in this case, Wikipedia, or like in this case, Freebase. So if you want to know what actually is meant by standardization, you can look at this URL. You get a representation in uh, RDF, for example, or um, yeah, in, in, uh, in JSON, in, in the case of Freebase also, or uh, uh, DBPD are the same. You can also get uh, JSON. And then you can really have the full reasoning chain, for example, and say, uh, let's try to understand digital rights management is something in computer science. So you, you have this um, typization for free. So you, you can go up in the categories and see the, uh, DRM is something in computer science, which is something in general science, and so on. So you can have all sorts of uh, advanced analysis on top. Um, so basically, the main message here is um, from strings, like in this case, misuse of standardization, go to things that are well defined in uh, these knowledge bases. Yes, please. Uh, where did you, how did you calculate the relevance score? Or did they, did they um, th this comes back from the services. So each of these services has some sort of uh, returning the relevance um, and using them all in combination. So um, I have a very simple um, reconciliation service that um, I think uh, simply calculates the average mean um, out of the different services output. Um, if they agree, so if uh, in this case Samantha and say, for example, Spotlight agreed on the same thing, so saying this is standardization in the, in the sense of this, um, then yeah, simply using the relevance scores in combination. So this is not really rocket science. All the hard work is done by these services, right? I'm just using them, okay? And um, there was a uh, sheep first, I think. Um, how did you handle conflicts? Say a standardization meant one thing in, in one service and standardization meant another thing in another service, and each of them were very yeah. sure about you know, what that meant? But um, it if they're both very sure, which rarely happens, um, I simply take the one that is sure of. <laughs> but typically, typically they, they, uh, they kind of have like, this disagreement in, like, enough disagreement so that conflicts rarely occur. Um, so if you look at these services, in general, it's not so much a problem of um, conflicts in the sense of a uh, thing not really being correct. It's more a sense of, more in the sense of, uh, so let's say you have a tweet from someone saying, President Barack Obama's speech yesterday was great. So an entity that a human being could extract would be, for example, President Barack Obama. Right? This would be one named entity con uh, consisting out of three words. But a machine could also say, well, president per se is already a concept. So one possible annotation would also be to say, it's president as one entity as defined in the US president, which is, in the current case, a concrete case, um, Barack Obama. Um, but yeah, it, it's more like these subtle differences where sometimes one service will say it's the whole concept consisting of three separate words, and an another service saying um, it's actually um, President Barack Obama and Barack Obama in separate. But uh, overall, this doesn't really <coughs> run you into trouble. And also, one of the things by using four services in combination is um, most of these services, or actually all of these services, I think, are trained for longer, longer um, things like um, news articles, for example. If you throw something very short, like a tweet at them, um, kind of all their optimizations will run um, yeah, kind of in vain because they don't have enough text to add enough context. Which is also why we as human beings, sometimes when we, when we look at tweets out of complete isolation, just look at one line of tweet, we cannot really make sense out of it. So very often for very short messages, we will have trouble finding um, enough information to really make sense out of it. Um, but um, if you use 
all these services in combination, typically enough at least to yeah, say it seems to be about politics in the broader sense, or yeah, just this sort of thing um, can be extracted. I think, yeah, now let's hear this. Yes, uh, most websites have a hierarchical uh, structure so that you can index and spider the site and, and grab content media. The social media sites, say for example Facebook, many businesses have a Facebook page, but it's not a higher, Facebook is not a hierarchically laid out uh, structure, so it's hard to spider and gather the content. So in the previous slide, you were referring to many of the, much of the social content. How do you scrape or index or, or the, uh, the social content? Um, so in this case, it's not, um, it's not crawling, it's not scraping. It's simply using the public search APIs. So if you know it was an event about um, a Madonna concert, you would use human natural search terms and say Madonna concert to then try to find that event. So it's not really um, a big machine crawling all of social media. No, it's more like reactive, searching for well-known terms that you will know will kind of so reveal. you use Google search engine or say social media search engine? Um, social media search APIs. So uh, it would be a lot more interesting, I would say, um, to really actually crawl social media. But then you run into all sorts of trouble, like legal issues and so on. Um, you don't want to be that guy who runs into that sort of trouble. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm using just public search APIs. Um, and then also, Twitter, for example, has the streaming API, where they just stream random messages at you, and you try to make sense of it. Um, but it's only Twitter. The other social networks don't do that. So um, I'm trying to have this uh, social network agnostic view. So really considering all social networks, which is why I can't use streaming API, even if it is interesting in isolation, if you try to really have this uh, agnostic view of looking at more than just one social network, which not many people do, by the way, um, most of the papers are on just Twitter because they have this open, open API. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm using more reactive search APIs, which also keeps me completely out of trouble because what these search APIs find is public information that people have shared. So it's not your private uh, Facebook picture where you were drunk uh, on the street. <laughs> no. Or if you happen to share it publicly, it's your own fault. It's not the search network's fault and not the person's fault who searched for it. Right? So um, it's really all public information. Nothing secret, nothing internal. Um, so that's kind of the good news. Um, but of course, if you have internal access to the social networks, you could do a little bit more, maybe. But um, this research that I'm doing is more meant to be, in the broader sense, using social networks just as concepts, not really as V1 Facebook or V1 Google Plus or whatever. So hopefully this kind of responds to it. So all of Twitter, Facebook, um, Twitter, tw all Twitter. of them have these APIs. Yeah, so. all these networks have search APIs. Quick question, and I know I don't want you to lose track of, the, of your talk, but in, in your example of the speech that Barack Obama gave yesterday was great, mm -hmm. would, the, would those um, entity extractors know that yesterday, would, did they go outside the string and figure out what date that it was posted, so know which date yesterday was, or do you have to um, know? They know, they know. They so do these know. don't. Um, there are services that try to figure out with the context, context of when I say yesterday now, what does that mean date was, mm -hmm. um, but these won't. The good thing is, um, it's on the previous slide, all those search APIs give you this. So they tell you exactly when something was posted. So if you were interested in making sense of that, you could do it on, on, based on that. All right. So um, again, all the credit goes to these services. I'm just using these services and kind of reconciling their different output um, to then make sense out of something very short like this. Question here? Yeah, well, I was going to ask for more general questions, but let me, let me just mention that, uh, maybe I'll say that until later. <coughs> um, what, for, the, for, for this example, for, um, what would it have taken for a site to come up with a relevance of one? Um, I don't really know because this is a black box, this is a black box, 
If I were to look into the source for the, this one, it wouldn't be a black box, but it didn't, so for me it's a black box, <laughs> and this is a black box. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, all the credits for these services, I'm just using them, right? Um, if you were really into, um, yeah, main entity extraction and disintegration, um, you would have to write your own main entity extractor, but I don't, right? So this is not my field of research. I'm just applying that to uh, make sense out of, out of these messages. Okay, thank you. My, I thought part of your algorithm was to have determined that relevance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my, my modest contribution is just uh, reconciling all those different services. But yeah, it's no real contribution. So just <laughs> to give you, to give you um, a feeling of what this is here, right? <laughs> uh, well, I hope I have different contributions, <laughs> but I just need that one step, right? So uh, I mentioned it, um, and um, yeah. So we've talked a lot about all those different services now. Um, I'm giving credit not only here in this talk, but actually in the semantics that I make post on social networks. Um, so I'm using all those different services in combination. But then um, I want to give credit and say, in my generated early after this, so this micropost has the concepts, uh, I don't know, digital, digital rights management, rights management, and uh, standardization. I want to give credit and say, standardization was found by uh, Samantha, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, DRM was found by Wikipedia Spotlight. So how can I do that? Um, I'm using uh, an ontology that, were, that is called the provenance ontology that very deeply allows me to give full credit up to the HTTP request level that was generated to actually get that data back. Um, so if you want the full dirty, dirty details look at this uh, publication, um, the thing is, all the services have kind of different um, ways to use them. So uh, for uh, DBpedia Spotlight, you can work with a, with a HTTP GET request where you just uh, paste in uh, to a URL, your text, and you get back something. For Open Calais, you have to construct an XML message that is kind of ugly, and you have to post it to the service and then get back the XML and convert it into something uh, more useful and so on. So the basic message here is all those different services use, of course, because the different services use different paradigms to do things. Um, so using um, this provenance ontology, I can say, for this service, this is what I used. These are the potential fine-tuning parameters. So you can say, um, for some services, you can kind of determine the recall and say, um, only return something if you're very sure or not so sure, or I don't know. Um, so you can kind of set filters. Um, so that then, if you were to look at uh, the generator or the app in this case, that you then could completely reproduce the HTTP messages that were made to get um, the annotation. If you look at um, the generated RDF, it's really, so let me go one slide back. It's not short like that one. This is just a simplified, simplified JSON representation where credit is given at this um, very low level um, where you lose all the semantic information of the HTTP request. Um, it's a quite complex, long list of triples that is not very practicable, but still, um, in this paper, we went through the uh, thought exercise of actually doing that. Um, it's not practicable, but we did it just to show it's possible. Um, and uh, it's very important. So this is just a, an over overview of that uh, provenance ontology. It is possible to use ontologies to really track back um, different web services used in combination and uh, give credit to the original sources. Um, all right, so this is the first step of making sense out of textual metadata. So now up to the second step, deduplicating the item. So remember those two uh, photos that were quite similar with the faces on the street on Times Square. So this was New York Times Square, by the way. Um, so for that, we need kittens. And we need a piece of kittens. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the whole image. This is a smaller piece of the image. This is another piece of the image. The good thing is, it's still the same kitten, and it's not killed. It's still alive, even if you crop it. Um, but what do we do here? So what we actually do here is um, we take one image, kitten.jpg, and we crop it, but not physically by creating a new resource, 
But we plot it by saying we add some hash fragment here, x, y, w, h, so x, y for the points, and then width and height, and say from the whole kitten image, take, I don't know, a, a rectangle, or in this case a square, 50, 50, at points uh, 100x, 100y, 50, 50, this one square, right? So what we do here is we generate a so-called media fragment, so part of the whole thing. Um, we will see why we need that later on. Um, media fragments and uh, the format that I'm using here is not something that um, yeah, I just pulled out of my head and used it. No, it's well defined in W3C spec, um, where I have collabor collabor collaborated on, that is called the media fragments you write specification. So um, in order to do this sort of uh, kitten cropping, you can use this sort of syntax and uh, it's actually, hopefully, landing soon in web browsers. So that actually, in a web browser, you could have an image um, tag just like that, and then see not this result, but actually see the smaller results, the cropped results, just by using this sort of uh, media fragment um, annotation. Um, right now, this is not um, in browsers yet, but um, I have developed a polyfill that actually allows you to um, just include a library and then use this sort of syntax to um, crop kittens. So why the hell do we need that? Let's go to the next slide to find out. Um, so as I said before, media fragments are not new resources, but they're fragments of existing resources. Um, so when we compare images, like in this case, this image, you can see they're different. Uh, so you can see, for example, the green fall here is not represented here. Um, I don't know, this lady is more enthusiastic here than there, or vice versa, I don't know. Um, so you can see this light is off, uh, sorry, this light is on, and here this light is off. Um, but obviously these are from the same scene, taken probably by the same person, just at short uh, distances of time. Um, so in our algorithm, we now finally need those media fragments to compare tile by tile the images. So what we do is basically we put a grid over each image, like this and this, and then we compare tile by tile, are those images, are, are, are those media fragments, so are those tiles essentially different, or are they more or less the same? So therefore we calculate um, the average histogram values per um, tile, and then very simply compare tile by tile, how about um, the similarity between them. And if they're above a certain threshold, we say they're dis uh, different. If they're below a certain threshold, we say they're still similar enough. And uh, then we still need to simply define um, an overall minimum limit of tiles that need to be similar enough. And then we can say, like in this case, the images are on absolute different, but overall, just using the similarity features, they're still similar enough. Um, this works for photos. But if we have videos, just one second, let me finish that. If we have videos, we have a different problem because video is are moving images, right? So it's one image after the other, frame per frame. Um, if we want to do that for video, we need a different um, image. So what we need is time. So welcoming the new T parameter in the URL. T is simply for time. So here we can say um, comma 10. So comma means nothing before, so from the beginning until uh, 10, which is the end, we look at a video resource and take, in this case, the first 10 seconds. And then, in this video, we define yet another uh, square, like a tile, in this case, and then we can make statements about it. So we can say, from this video, seconds zero, so this is just a simplified um, notation, from the simplified, uh, sorry, from, from zero and up to 10 seconds in the video, at the square zero, oh no, it's a rectangle in this case, zero, zero, so here, uh, and then 30, 40. Um, this is a MA, as in uh, the media ontology, a media fragment. So first we say the type about it, and then we can make additional statements about it. So just uh, apply RDF and say this thing, this media fragment, depicts, in the sense of folk, a face. 
So they can say, in this video, there is a face hunting. They can say, in this video, um, there is a person, or in this video, there is something. Um, and then we need the same thing again. But, uh, I think it's a 10-10 yeah, in this case, a square. And you can say it's, a, it's also a media fragment. And its color is defined as an RGB uh, F00, so like an SCSS F00. So we can make uh, semantic statements here based on similar types. OK, so the story is almost over. Now we just need to put it together. And uh, what we did here is we have visualized kind of what the algorithm does. So if you remember, let's get back to the images again. We're talking about these two images. So the differences are mainly this green fog, this green fog, maybe this lady that moves on, and so on. So slightly different things. And what we have done here is um, we have in this in these two images, the tiles that are similar, and below, the tiles that are different. And you can clearly see this is the green fog that was up here, and this is, the, this is left, and this is right, of course. So here it's black, here it's green. So let's go back again to see that again. Here it's black, here it's green. So you can really see what the algorithm does. Um, and why did it say contains a face? So let's go back again, sorry. Uh, why did I say here contains a face or depicts a face? Because the algorithm does, on the one hand, this very low level pixel analysis, like looking at the average histogram of a certain tile, um, but also tries to detect faces in the image and then tries to match the number of faces. So if the number of fa faces is the same on the left and right hand side, um, it's probably the same um, image or video. Um, all right. And what you maybe can't see here is some of the slides have this checkerboard um, pattern. So why is that? Um, if you look at, so it's basically the whole row here below. So let's have a look at the actual images again. You can see everything here is almost completely dark. Why is it dark? Well, because it was night. But if you have a video, and um, remember how videos typically look like, they're 16, 16 by 9. So typically, in uh, old TVs that don't have the format of uh, new TVs, you have the black bar at the beginning, black bar at the, uh, black bar at the top, and black bar at the bottom. So um, very typically with social media, when you have these sort of things, complete black and complete white are not very useful. Complete black because of videos. Complete white. Anyone have an idea why complete white is typically, typically not useful? I think social media. Contrast, yeah, yeah. But um, like think of what people share on social media. It's really hard. It's really hard. Screenshots, bingo. So very, t very often times, and more often than people think, people look at Twitter, people see, uh, I don't know, things I said to my girlfriend to get her in debt. So people take a screenshot of that and say, why the hell would someone, or would this be trending on Twitter? And this happens more often than you think. So people <laughs> taking screenshots of um, applications, like in this case the, the Twitter website, for example, and asking, why the hell is that happening? So it, it happens often enough to, for this um, deep application algorithm that is really tailored to a certain, a certain network data, to say, if you, uh, if you see pure, pure white, which is what you typically see on web pages, besides the text, of course, um, then simply don't consider it. So this is what the algorithm does. Um, it doesn't consider, in this, in this case, the checkerboard tiles that are simply too black. So this one is like not really super black, but everything else is almost complete black. Um, so it took a lot of uh, fine tuning to get that one right. Um, but it's an algorithm that is really tailored to the kind of information that you encounter on social networks. Um, so what we did then is, in order, I will, I will uh, take questions in just a sec. Um, what we did then is, um, when we had this algorithm and we tested it with real, real users, people were like, yeah, but why is that together? Or why is that not together? Or why are they clustered and why are the, uh, those two not clustered? Um, so we needed some way um, to tell the human readers why a certain set of images would be, or videos would be clustered together and others wouldn't. Um, 
And tell me how we did that in just a second. I take questions. So I think someone here and someone here. I think it might be related. If you have a, a hundred images that you're trying to kind of cluster, do you all have one base image that you compare across all the other 99? Or is it some other way that you can randomly take images? And exactly, yeah. So it's, um, it's more or less k-means. So you start with a random image, and then you try to find um, a set of images that is similar enough compared to that one. Uh, over here, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so, so basically, uh, you know, did you compile your uh, your algorithm versus the classic C the family, you know, based the similarity, you know, comparison algorithms? Uh, uh, something like that, you know, uh, for this uh, deduplication, uh, the images are you know quite similar, so you know people use uh, you know, C, C the features to, to compile the you know, uh, the image contents. Uh, okay, uh, so it doesn't look at the image content, so it doesn't try to really understand the semantic sense of what is in the image or who is in the image. And it really is a, a low-level algorithm that just looks at the pixel contents. It's mainly because it needed to be fast. It needs to be applied more or less in real time. So object detection, first it's not my field. I don't know how to do that. And, uh, but then also it needs to be fast. So it does not do object detection. There are, of course, some algorithms to do that, like uh, if you do uh, SIFT, uh, you can at least see similar patterns that occur in both images. Um, but uh, yeah, in this case, it's completely not that. So it's a very simple algorithm that is designed to be super fast, designed to be kind of maybe even too aggressive sometimes, but it tries to do its job well, and the job is simply compiling, uh, condensing this big amount of media data to something more manageable that human beings are willing to consume in a considerable amount of time. Uh, I think some, yeah, there was an idea. Uh, do you handle the aspect ratios or the slightly different angle on the image? So like, would you like search and skew it slightly? Um, yes, so, but really again, very low tech again, by having thresholds of the number of slide, uh, of, of tiles that need to be the same. So that if you have a scene that is like that, and then a little bit shifted, um, still the, um, the tiles that are not shifted would be the same. So it's really very low tech, designed to be super fast. Um, all right, so now the human reader started asking, but why are those two images not, not clustered together? So what we did is um, we published a paper, and I'm very proud of that uh, title. Tell me why, ain't nothing but a mistake. <laughs> Tell me why. <laughs> so, um, describing media item differences with media fragments, you write, and speech synthesis. So, we actually work uh, on, an, on, a, on a speech synthesizer that would uh, describe to human beings why certain images are different based on well defined criteria. Um, it uses an open source uh, speech synthesizer in uh, pure JavaScript. Uh, so, open source by someone whose name on GitHub is Kripken, um, speak.js. Um, and this guy, in turn, has uh, converted a speech synthesizer from, I think, C into JavaScript. Um, and this one is called eSpeak. So, it's a well known uh, speech synthesizer um, converted into JavaScript. The good thing is, if it's JavaScript, it runs into the browser. And um, so, in this case, let's have a look at what <coughs> the readers would hear if they uh, wondered why those, Im why those two images are clustered together. Um, so it's a very short screencast. Um, let me simply put the mic close to the speakers and start the video. When the two tiles were not considered as they are either too bright or too dark, which is a common source of clustering issues. Neither the left nor the right need the either contain detected faces. Hmm. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds kind of a uh, funny way to do that, but actually it helped the human readers a lot. Because um, they didn't really have clear this concept of uh, why complete black or complete white would not be considered. And again, we did not tell them anything. So we just gave them media items that were clustered or not clustered. And um, they were, as I said, oftentimes wondering why is that or why is that, why is that not. And um, we as human beings are very strong in doing what you, suggest, uh, you suggested in 
detecting like the same persons are in the, in the image or the same red ball is in the image, but um, machines don't have this capability of saying this, this set of red pixels is a ball. So that's a so-called semantic gap. Um, but um, using this sort of approach, we could then give the human readers a hint why or why not. So tell me why and nothing but a mistake. Um, those two images and vi videos were clustered together. Um, so like that, we could improve some of the parameters of the algorithm. And uh, we will, I think, in the next slide, yeah. So we will see in the next couple of slides um, what we do finally to yeah, use all this information that is contained in social networks. Namely, we will look at how we can merge social network interactions. Um, so again, think back to one of the earlier slides with all the different social networks, and think back of how completely different the social network YouTube looked like compared to Twitter, compared to Facebook, compared to Google+, compared to Twitpic, whatever. Um, but on all those different social networks, they can do different things similar like social interactions. On Facebook, it's called like. On Google+, it's called plus one. Um, I kind of hate that, but <laughs> it looks like plus, colon, space, plus. <laughs> that's, that's what they chose. Um, on YouTube, you can give thumbs up, you can give thumbs down, but none of the other social networks allow you to do that. It's a very strong sig signal, doing something some, no, thumbs down, but none of the other social networks do that, but you can use the thumbs up. Um, on Instagram, you can love, so heart something, love something, um, and the list goes on. So what we did is we again came up with a set of abstractions, an abstraction layer on top of social network interactions, and uh, we call those likes, shares, comments, and views. So likes, I'll just uh, give you the examples. You can see the complete table of what we say is a like on the different social networks here. Then we have shares. So share is really on Facebook, hitting the share button, and resharing someone else's post. Google Plus, you can do the same thing. On Twitter, you can do the same, same thing. You hit the retweet button. So not manual retweet, the native retweet function that was introduced um, later on when uh, Twitter suddenly realized we actually need them. Um, the function of comments is evident on Facebook, Google Plus, Instagram. On Twitter, you have this old school manual retweet. So some clients allow you to do uh, quotation marks and then the site tweet. Other clients, so applications, um, allow you to do RT, so just the letter, letters RT. And uh, the uh, handler of the person. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of other, so there's this recycling symbol, someone maybe have, has seen that one. Um, but basically the idea is, you reuse someone's idea and add your own comments to it, which is very limited on uh, 140 characters. But um, I tend to do that, and uh, a lot of other people do that as well. So manual retweets and add replies. So when you reply on someone's idea, on someone's tweet. Um, fit the comments and so on, the list goes on. And then finally, you have views. Some of the social networks allow you to have an impression of the number of views that a certain video has, uh, has had or a certain Flickr image has had, Twitter image, and so on. So you can see it's not the same length of list everywhere. So shares is the least common social interaction paradigm on the different social networks. So this has a consequence that sometimes we have null values. So null means simply we don't know because the social network in question does not support it. This is different from zero, where we you know it's a well-known zero, so there are well-known no comments on that one Instagram image. Um, so what we do here is um, we have the different media items, like in this case, this image is what, that was shared uh, on Instagram and on Twitter, and we know that on Twitter we have an unknown number, number of likes, because on Twitter you can't like things. But it was retweeted three times, so shared three. Um, we don't know nothing about comments and about views. And here on Instagram, two likes, so someone pressed two, ti two times hard, about two different persons, pressed two times the hard button on their Instagram application or on the website, and uh, 
well known, zero comments. And then it's super straightforward to just summarize 2 plus null, so null we treat it as 0, 2. Null plus 3, 3, and so on, so you get the picture. We can merge all the social interactions uh, thanks to the social network interaction abstraction layer that we've introduced before. So, super simple. Now we have for each cluster, so this is a very small cluster, of course, but typically these clusters have 4, 5, 6, 7 media items in them, and um, then all those numbers add up to something meaningful. So you can then make statements about the whole cluster and use this in the next step to finally rank all the second clusters. Right? So this is what we wanted to do. Um, okay, so the ranking formula is again something very simple. And if you've done ranking on the web, you know the web is an evil place. There are spammers. There are a lot of evil persons that try to trick the index. Social media is less hostile, so for the moment at least, something very simple works. Like in this case, alpha times likes, beta times shares, gamma times <coughs> comments, delta times views, and so on. And uh, then below you have epsilon times cluster size, recency, and uh, volume. So let's dive into all those different parameters. Um, so here you see. Uh, examples again, and here this is a good example. You have a screenshot of an application, a screenshot of Twitter, you have the black bars here, but still they're similar enough to, similar enough to be clustered together. And then, so this, someone took, I think this is a slide, so someone in the audience took um, an image of the projection, projection, and you can see it's kind of similar, but it's not the same. But typically all those images are different enough, as, sorry, similar enough that they, convey, that they convey still the same idea. So probably this was something interesting from the talk. Um, but yeah, you can see it's basically the same image. And here you can see a, a, keynote, a keynote scene um, two times and so on. Um, so let's have a look at the two lines of um, the ranking formula. We have yellow and we have green. <coughs> yellow are, of course, the social interaction uh, features that we've introduced before. So that's very straightforward. And uh, then below in green, we have more or less different signals also, like cluster size, recency, and quality. Quality, let's start with quality. Quality is, of course, um, somewhat an abstract concept. But if you think of what makes a good image, typically an image in higher resolution will be better than an image in lower resolution. Um, an image of a higher file size, typically, uh, or a bigger file size, typically will be better than an image of lower file size, and so on. So here you can have very simple, um, yeah, kind of heuristics to determine which of these images is of bigger quality, uh, or of higher higher quality. And remember, they're all in one cluster, visually similar. So you can really reduce yourself to looking at the low level signals to get a good feeling of an image's quality. Recency is very simple because we just look at the age of the timestamp when a certain video or uh, image was published. And in one cluster, you of course take the youngest one to get a feeling of the recency of the whole cluster. And then cluster size, what is cluster size? Um, very simple, if you go one slide back, cluster size here is one, two, three, cluster size here is one, two, three, here it's two, and here it's one. So this kind of gives you a feeling of how popular is a certain media item that is similar to others on social networks in general. So you can see here, this one was only shared on Instagram. This one was shared on Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, here it's YouTube, Twitter, Twitter, right? So um, cluster size kind of gives you a feeling of cross-network popularity of a certain media item. Or, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> then we uh, took this ranking formula and applied it. These are the values that you have to put in for the Greek letters to get reasonable results. But uh, again, it's a ranking, so rankings are really hard to uh, evaluate. So take these values with a grain of salt in the application that I will show you later on. They're, uh, they're flexible, so you can change them and see interactively how the changed ranking would look like. Um, OK, so this very simple ranking, ranking formula works. All right. so. Finally, almost to the implementation details, how is this realized? It's basically a client-side web application with 
a very limited Node.js backend. So again, it's meant to be something that is really running on the web, no complex application that needs no low-level access to, uh, I don't know, um, certain business features. No, it's meant to be something that runs on the web so that really it can be deployed easily and that people can actually use it. Um, it uses um, Node.js. Why is that? Because of all those different events that happen. Um, an image arrives, an image gets annotated, um, an image gets uh, flip, uh, split into tiles, the tiles get, um, uh, the, the, the average histogram of the tiles gets, uh, gets calculated and so on. So a lot of events that happen asynchronously and then Node.js is really great at uh, dealing with that. Um, so whenever an event happens, Node.js um, just takes care of the whole thing without blocking the main uh, execution thread. Um, okay, and then where is what uh, component? Media and retrieval, so taking the images from the social networks and then entity extraction is on the server. Everything else is on the client, so everything else is really running on your browser locally. And this includes face detection, which can be kind of uh, sketchy sometimes, uh, clustering, ranking, and so on. The application a bit later. We have one final step to go. Now we have this ranked set of, me, uh, of our clusters. Um, take the question now. Okay. So uh, how did you guys do the face detection on the client side? Did you guys convert OpenCV to, to JavaScript? Uh, not we, but uh, someone else. Oh, was, uh, <laughs> <doing that. laughs> um, yeah, so there's this uh, library mscripten that allows you to yeah, right, right. take uh, C code, more right. or less, or LLVM code, and compile that to JavaScript. So someone has, already did that. Yeah, someone has, has done that and taken OpenCV and converted it to JavaScript, okay. which then allows us to, yeah, with a very easy API, do face detection in the browser. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we have this set of ranked clusters. So now all that needs to be done is uh, compile them and make them beautiful, make them useful, make them aesthetically pleasing, make them even entertaining so that someone um, who just wants to get a feeling of the event could um, go out, use their browser to, uh, yeah, just browse um, a media gallery. Okay, so media gallery generation is more complex than you may think. So, probably if you are on a, a social network and you have looked at your photos section, you've seen something similar to that. One big image, four small ones. One big image, two small ones. One big image, four small ones, and so on. And then you can see here, two small ones, two small ones. So you get kind of this um, grid of the different images that are composed by four small ones or three small ones, sometimes even, um, and so on. What is the obvious problem of that? You need to have all images in the same um, uh, aspect ratio. So cropping is required, which sometimes works quite well. So in this case, if you didn't know the image, or in this case even, if you didn't know the original image, you would say, that's perfect, that's cool. But then sometimes, you have this image, this type of, type of images, so you can clearly see, oh, ouch, something's missing. Or this one here, uh, something is obviously missing. But in most of the cases, cropping works decently well. And remember, we know where the faces are, so at least we can try not to crop the faces. Sometimes you run into difficulties, into conflicts, when you have an image where two persons here, then nothing, then one person there. So where do you crop them? At some point, you need to say, okay, so maybe we take those two guys and get rid of this guy, or you try to somehow get this one and the one over there, but then you don't get them entirely, so you get them half only. So you can kind of see it's a hard problem. And um, this is also a hard problem, because for doing this, you have to know that, oh, actually there's text, written text in the image. So you have to do OCR, optical character recognition, which is also hard. Um, so you can see already there is no such thing as the optimal cropping algorithm. There's only, for example, one good one for a certain set of um, image categories, like screenshots. Never ever cut uh, crop screenshots, for example, because you will lose the whole context. This could be a heuristic. If you have faces, try to maximize the number of still uh, alive faces after cropping. Um, so you can see it's an evil growth out there. 
And uh, cropping images is not a solved problem in the sense of social media, because social media has a lot of different image formats. I will show you on the next slide what is uh, a problem. But then what is good about that, people look at it, and they start typically, so maybe, can I ask you, what was the first image that you saw on this one? The big one. The big one, right. You? Oh, the thing with the text in the middle bottom. This one? Yeah. Okay. So you can see already by two examples, it's different what people started looking at first. But the thing is, people need focal points. So probably you were, uh, you were attracted by the brightness of this white. I don't know, but probably this is what your brain did. Can you tell why you looked at this one? Okay, so um, probably it was also, you started from the left to, uh, to the right, because this is just how in the Western world people um, yeah, are used to reading text and yeah, browsing pages. Um, the eye needs focal points. So you started with this big one, someone else started with big, this big one. Um, people typically don't start with the small ones, unless they're like really super, I don't know outstanding compared to everything else around, which sometimes can happen. But um, then you slowly start exploring, right? So probably you started here, but then you looked up here, and then you went here, and so on. So people typically don't feel overwhelmed by this sort of uh, media galleries. But people then see this kind of cropping issues. So you can see this kind of media gallery has ups and downs, as always in life. Um, we call that one loose ordering varying size style. Where this comes from, you can look it up in uh, this publication that is somewhere on, uh, on an earlier slide. Um, it was actually um, done together with someone from, uh, from Facebook. Um, so he had written all the, all the different uh, yeah, algorithms, and uh, he allowed me to use them. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, the algorithms? Yeah, so this was a Facebook employee who uh, made available those uh, algorithms as... Yeah, that's, uh, if you look at this uh, paper, it's uh, in the citations. The guy is called uh, Christopher Schiller, it's a Frenchman. Um, all right, so you can see this, this has ups and downs. So there's, of course, something to deal with it. So this is a different event. Um, it's Facebook's launch of browser. Um, so Facebook graph search, um, and when they introduced that, there was, of course, a big event where Mark Zuckerberg spoke. Um, and then look at it a bit in more detail. So now you can see this is line by line, right? And each image of each line has the same height. But look at this image. This actually is one big image. It's a banner, like a <coughs> big leaderboard banner uh, in AdSpeak. Um, that someone has put on social media. This is very typical to so account for social media. Social media is not just like your typical photos, it's people who put everything there, like starting from screenshots from why the hell is whatever term trending on Twitter, up to people taking banner ads or banners or whatever random format uh, images and putting them on social media. Of course, the vast majority is still is something that is more or less what we typically associated with photo format, like this uh, 4 by 3 or whatever. Um, but um, it's, it's uh, an evil world out there in the sense of you do not really know what to expect on social media, which also what makes it very interesting. But um, if you look at this sort of media gallery, you can see you don't have to crop this big image. And if you had to crop it, it would probably look crap. So um, here, this is not necessary. But then um, you can see all the different images per line have the same height. So if you would measure the height of this line compared to the height of this line compared to the height of this line, they're all different heights. And if you look at uh, the lines, so here is a line, here is a line, the next line is here, the next line is here, here, and here. So you can see there's no regular grid anymore, but still it kind of seems consistent. But the problem is we're missing the focal points now. So most people, when they see this sort of media gallery, they start to read line by line. So reading, reading in the sense of reading line by line, what is the image? So we did a user study with uh, different um, 
yeah, users who were exposed to both sorts of media galleries. And the feedback that we got was, it looks nice sometimes, as in this case, because it works really well because of the banner. But in most cases, so if you would imagine only seeing this, people felt overwhelmed because they started reading line by line, and then in the half of it, they got tired because they were missing the focal points. So each media gallery style, that's the short message here, has its pros and cons. There is no such thing as the one good media gallery style, which is also why it's a permanent source of, uh, of optimization. And um, they are also sometimes just try and error and see what looks better for a given set of images, or, uh, or videos also. Um, so yeah, there's pros and cons. But um, the good thing is we can add interactivity. So it's not just printed media gallery that you put, just one second, that you put in a newspaper. It's something that is on the internet, so we can add interactivity. Yeah. Do you try to add your caps to the images? Or to add <laughs> caps? <laughs> uh, I should add that to a future work, yes. <laughs> um, all right, so we can add uh, interactivity. Um, it's kind of boring to see it in the screen screenshots. I will hopefully show that in a live demo more. This guy is actually here, and then you can see this one zooms out instead. Um, the good thing here is um, everything else, so I think I have that on the next slide in a bigger way. Yeah, everything else gets faded out, gets kind of blurred, so that you've put the full focus, the full concentration on just one media item. It can be one video that you feature full screen, uh, no, sorry, not full screen, but in this exclusive view. Um, or it can be, as in this case, um, this Twitter image of um, yeah, this uh, person that wears uh, the mask here um, from the Occupy movement. So this is, uh, by the way, from the Occupy Gezi movement in, uh, in Turkey now. Um, so with this sort of additional feature, we can add interactivity. We can add some way of interactively browsing the media gallery um, so that you still have focal points, but still you also don't get overwhelmed because you can simply line, uh, sorry, item by item browse them through. Um, so this is research. So in research, you have to have related work. And there is, thank God, a lot of related work in that field. Um, so what are others trying to do? Um, there are different now commercially and uh, also academical uh, companies um, that are trying to do more or less what I'm doing here but with different focuses. So I'm really trying to summarize. But most of these um, applications out there do is they try to archive. Um, so there are three, uh, at least, probably even more, commercial companies, Identifier, Mahaya, with a product called Scene, and uh, Storyfy, that try to archive and try to, um, yeah, in some, to some extent, to summarize events. And uh, there's also academic uh, research going on. So guys from uh, the University of France that I've uh, collaborated also with, um, they have implemented Media Finder, where you can see a screenshot here. So you can see it tries to cluster by different clusterization um, signals. Um, this one is uh, Eventifier where you can see yeah, they have this sort of uh, media gallery that we've seen before, but they have also tweets and videos and so on. Um, and then what do we have left? So this one is Scene, so from Mahaya, um, where they have this uh, more linear approach. And um, they split an event, like in this case. So th these are all media galleries, by the way, from the Semtech conference. So this was a uh, four day, five day, even if you count the first. Uh, pre-day where, where a hackathon took place. So five days, and uh, they all try to somehow um, make sense out of it, so with more or less condensation in between. So you can see here, I've always taken the whole web page as it was displayed. So here you have pagination. I'm not sure if you can see that. And it's probably below the fold. So here they have pagination. So you could go page by page. Those guys have everything on one page. And those guys, so this is Storyfy, have really everything in one long stream. Um, and then also different um, solutions do things differently, of course. Um, Eventifier focuses fully on Twitter, so no other social network. What ends up on Facebook, they probably wouldn't find it unless someone shares a link 
on Twitter, Twitter, and Facebook page, which sometimes also happens, by the way. Um, these guys seem, I think, they also focus on Twitter, but they also use some Instagram in integration. Um, take everything what I'm saying here with a grain of salt, because obviously I can't look into the commercial uh, code, what they're actually doing in the back end, but just by trying to reverse engineer sort of what they're, what they're doing, that's my suspicion. Um, these two guys are semi-automatic, so you give them an event hashtag, and then it uh, kind of searches that hashtag. Storyfy is completely manual. So you start with the story. So you say, my story is, I want to summarize the center conference in San Francisco. Um, but then they facilitate searching for different terms on various social networks. But it's still a manual curation task. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, um, I'm trying to automate this stuff. By, uh, by saying, I'm really focusing on, on archive and on archiving um, exclusively in event, but also on uh, doing the summarization step. Um, all right, future work. What is next in the future? Um, maybe some of you have heard of an application called Wikipedia Life um, This was a small side project of mine that basically does nothing else but look at Wikipedia edits and try to make sense of it. Um, it does that surprisingly well. So Wikipedia has an IRC channel where whenever any of the articles on Wikipedia, and there are a lot of articles and a lot of languages in Wikipedia get, um, get edited, um, they send out an IRC message. They have written um, an application that tries to make sense out of those edits. Whenever an interesting edit happens, I try to clusterize to make sense out of it. Um, I will maybe show this application a bit later. Um, this is a screenshot from the day of the, uh, what is the word in English? Uh, um, a new uh, king gets basic crown. Coronation. Coronation, thank you. Of the coronation of the new king of the Netherlands. And the two breaking news candidates, as I call them, were the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands and the, the King Alexander of the ne Netherlands. And it worked for all some, uh, sort of things. So. This system also detected the Boston bombings, not before they happened, but yeah. very <laughs> shortly <laughs> after. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, it works really surprisingly well. So this is, in a certain sense, event detection based on Wikipedia. Um, what I'm imagining is um, having this one system running, and then adding the media gallery generation step, and then basically just bringing these two together so that you get breaking news candidates. So Wikipedia tells you some concept around the clean maximum of the Netherlands. It seems to be interesting at the moment. And then you use the information from social networks to get um, yeah, media content about that event and also get people's opinion about that event and uh, see if there's something um, that you could make sense of. And if you think of the Boston bombings, this was like the best example ever, albeit it was a very sad event, of course, um, but it was the best example of how social media is used, can help, but also is misused. So there was this one, uh, I think it was a cartoon, it was shared um, on social networks, of course, then, uh, then again, where it was um, newspapers reporting based on what they've heard on Twitter. Twitter people reporting based on what they've heard on Reddit. Reddit people <laughs> reporting on uh, yeah. what they have seen on the street. Yeah. And the guys on the street probably just has read a newspaper and you know, so uh, there was this kind of circle of trust that at some point was not broken, but in a certain sense, it was missing this, like, looking at, at things and uh, just waiting one more second before hitting that publish button. Um, so this is very important. Um, people in the race of being the first who is the one who reported that one new event that the police had, I don't know, uh, found that guy who was shot, whatever. So um, social networks can also be very dangerous. That's um, one of the aspects here. So, um, but yeah, connecting these two systems and then trying with all those different signals. So you have the kind of credibility of Wikipedia, but also the danger of everyone can edit anything on Wikipedia. But then still, the goodwill of the people who will then undo things very rapidly when. Uh, um, yeah, when, when something is not legit. Um, and then people on social media sharing stuff, but because of all this different
things that I've explained to you before, like visual similar clustering, um, ranking by social signal, and so on. So trying to use all that wisdom of the crowd using so many different signals, and then, of course, using your own brain, using your own common sense, to then try to avoid falling into a trap of uh, publishing something that was really a Photoshop thing. Um, question here. Maybe my question is not related to what you are talking, but I just wonder if it's a risky area, that that is a very belong to what can belong to Google, like uh, Wikipedia is a project of the Wikimedia Foundation, which uh, is a not for non-profit organization. Like, so, like everything in the world, like they want to put in, so, so they research each country or each, uh, you know. Oh, Wikipedia is available in, in many languages, and uh, all the different Wikipedias, so the French one, the French one. Uh, the so every country they have their non-profit for this program. Um, so the foundation has legal. Uh, seeds in different countries, but they all basically belong to uh, the Wikimedia Global Foundation. But uh, I'm not a legal person, so we are in the happy position to have donated to some of the Wikimedia projects, but it's nothing that is belonging to Google, so it's really completely independent of Google, which is good, which is very good. Um, but a lot of those big companies, Yahoo, Google, Bing, all of those big companies make actually use of Wikipedia data in some sort, um, and yeah, some of it published, some of it not published. Um, but Wikipedia is a very interesting uh, yeah, source for all sorts of signals. And uh, if, you heard of, if you've heard of uh, Knowledge Graph, Google Knowledge Graph, maybe this is something that is heavily based on Freebase, which has a lot of important parts that came from Wikipedia and that come from Wikipedia. So it's, it's basically give and take from different knowledge bases that then commercial companies like Google, like Yahoo, like Bing, um, convert into, yeah, propriety, whatever, closed knowledge graphs. But um, yeah, Wikipedia is completely open, completely independent. Everybody can contribute. And um, this application is, yeah, again, just an attempt to detect something that could be interesting in the sense of being a breaking news candidate. Um, I will show you all tools today. Um, the vision for a future work is bringing those two tools together and having really this one Uber application that does everything. Um, oh, by the way, Uber is a German word. I don't know if you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, you guys make a mistake, so it's not you, it's a you with two, two uh, points in the bottom. So that's an umlaut, yeah. Um, just as a side remark. Um, but it's funny to use that as a German. Sometimes you need to add this English pronunciation to it, so it's Uber. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. So languages are very important. Um, so why is it important? Because if you think of recent events in recent time, Occupy Gazi, I'm not sure if it makes many news here in the US, but it's a big thing in Europe. Um, there's this Occupy Gezi movement where uh, Turkish people have occupied a park because they the government wanted to convert that park into a shopping mall, and um, there's some 100-year-old trees, and people are generally not happy about what the government is doing. So they started occupying that park, which uh, is called uh, Taksim Gezi Park. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's, it's Turkish. <coughs> so uh, then they started um, yeah, to use tear gas to make the people go away, and um, they go very uh, violent, as you can see, for example, from this uh, image here. And um, yeah, you can see there's tear gas all over, and um, it's very bad things happening in Turkey uh, at the moment. Um, but all this on Twitter, on, on most social networks, uses this hashtag, Occupy Gazi. But um, as I said, I have this uh, system on Wikipedia that um, can detect breaking news events, or breaking news candidates. Um, there are several pages about that on Wikipedia. The first one is in German, so if you speak any German, you can read it. Um, if not, I will do it for you. Right? So this is German. 
This is connected with the English Wikipedia article, article 2013, Taksim Gezi Park protest. Not sure if anyone <laughs> speaks Greek? No? Yes? No? Okay, no one Greek? Um, this one is Turkish, and you can see it has all those funny Unicode characters. So this is not a typo, this is some sort of Turkish item. So, Taksim Gezi Park protest to maybe? I don't speak Turkish. Um, and then we have Kyrillic here. Um, anyone speaking Russian? Excellent. <laughs> the good thing is, we know that all those different concepts are interconnected in Wikipedia. So, we know that Wikipedia articles talk about the same concept, even if it's completely different languages. What is good about that? If we detect that one Wikipedia is talking about it, we can then try to use our background knowledge as human beings and say, well, it's an event that takes place in Turkey, so probably instead of just using Occupy Gezi as search terms, we can use the bold one here and use these funny Unicode characters that probably you would have to copy and paste because I have no clue how to put them on, in, uh, on an English keyboard. But if you want to get the maximum recall, like the maximum number of really first-class, first-hand um, media items from social network, you need to speak the language of those people. And uh, I don't, probably not all of us speak all languages of the world, but Wikipedia does. So you can see already, I think there is a lot of potential to connect all those different things, event detection on the, on the one hand, and then this uh, media item extraction on the other hand, and um, using all those different systems in combination. And um, I think this is yeah, the last slide. Um, I will demo all those applications now. Um, and I think we take the questions after. So let's start with LA Kings. It's not a good time to do this thing last night. <laughs> last <laughs> tonight? So last minute check, there was two oh, spoilers for spoiler yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you can see up there in the upper right corner, and there's some sort of activity um, signaling thing. And uh, hopefully, if the Wi-Fi is fast enough, yeah, it receives some results at least. And now it's downloading all the different media items. And uh, hopefully, if it finishes successfully, we will see some media items below them. So meanwhile, I can give you a little bit of a background. So this is for the similarity matching. So you can kind of set the thresholds for how similar and how different certain tiles may be or may not be. And uh, then we got first results. And here on the right hand side, this is for the ranking. So you can kind of fine tune the weights for the different signals. So likes, shares, and so on. Um, and then let's have a quick look at what we got back here. Um, the screen res resolution is very low. Um, but we have a couple of different media items um, on this event. And uh, if you look at um, the different, thick, uh, different different symbols here, we have all the social networks. So Instagram, Flickr, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, I saw Facebook before, yeah. Facebook, uh, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Instagram. Instagram again. Uh, yeah, so a lot of different social networks. Um, but this is one term. The next term is, of course, the other team, the Blackhawks. So I want to get a uh, general feeling of this event. So now we can simply add Blackhawks. Blackhawks, yeah, correct. Um, so you can see already what I'm doing here is I'm generating a search um, bundle. So, the, so different search terms that are related to the same event. Um, so let's wait until this finishes. So you can see, well, there's a lot of things going on. And, 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 and. How does it know you're not talking about helicopters? It doesn't. Birds. It doesn't. Um, the one day maximum range age will change. Um, so if you look at the, the range that you're looking at, it's like whatever was hot. So if all of a sudden you did the box hot down yesterday, that would come up. 
that's where that's where the human being comes into place. So this application tries to uh, facilitate um, the retrieval and the ranking. And um, here, what you can do is we can limit the the recency. So again, um, so funny enough, today I learned that here in LA there was some sort of uh, counter terror whatever training. So probably today we even had live calls in town. I found scary. This is about to come tomorrow. Oh really? Oh man, an MV. Okay. Have you heard about the LAPD history? You should be scared here anyways. Okay, so I so I'm not sure what happened here, so probably this time out, maybe it's still running. Uh, we can try again. Um, so the problem here is um, it's social networks, and it's many social networks in combination. So sometimes um, certain requests simply time out, or um, if like here, a lot of people are on the same Wi-Fi network, this can also have a negative impact. Some of these pictures might be the same. It's not finished yet. Yeah, so it's still loading. Hopefully it finishes. But you get uh, the overall point. Um, now I can add uh, things like playoffs and Stanley Cup. And uh, I can use, of course, LA Space Kings, Los Angeles Kings. So if you're a journalist... Oh, now they've finished twice. Okay. Um, so if you're a journalist, you kind of have this background knowledge of what is interesting. So my background knowledge came from Wikipedia when I read up on the Stanley Cup 2013. Um, but um, typically, if you're a journalist who covers a certain event, you hopefully have that background knowledge. Or better, you shouldn't not, or if not, you shouldn't not, you should not be writing that article. Um, so just to see what's going on now, let's turn uh, LA Kings off. So now you can see this one, this one, this one. Uh, do we see any actual Black Hawk helicopter? I don't know. But what we see is um, all those images are different. So uh, all those videos are also different. There's, oh, look for example here. This is a screenshot, right? So this one here. Someone, for some reason, adding a screenshot of that game. There's going to be more social media about hockey than there is going to be about helicopters, probably. <laughs> Yeah, so when did the game start? I think it was like... 7 o'clock. So now it's... Okay, so let's say maybe... Oops. I can say 5 hours ago. So you can see this changes interactively. We can add this one. And let's do one last thing. Let's add the Stanley Cup. And try searching for it. I mean, Vada can tell you, um, some of the images and videos have a red bar here. This happens when the face detector has detected faces. So probably it's these two persons were detected here. Meanwhile, this is, of course, for us human beings, it's very clear it's faces, but for the algorithm, they were just too small. Question? Uh, yeah, I, so Google just uh, recently uh, announced that, uh, their, uh, that they could basically determine box office results based upon uh, opening weekend box office results based upon the searches for the four weeks leading up to the movie premiere with 94% accuracy or something. I was just reading about that. Um, so I'm wondering the fact that there's 107 for LA Kings and 211 for Blackhawks and Blackhawks 1, if we can make any inferences. <laughs> I don't know. No, okay. Maybe we can. Um, let's see if Stanley Cup has finished. So let's turn everything else off. Maybe how many tickets they sold or something. Oh, so Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup is yeah. very popular. Now I can see something that uh, I'm happy that you see it. Um, social media is all about memes, right? People adding memes. So uh, this is the original, and this one is Black Hawks win on, um, what does it say? Let's actually click through so that you can really see I'm not making that up. Um, now I'm on Facebook. Um, Blackhawks win, what does it say below? Undefeated at home in the playoffs, not anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can see this came from uh, Facebook in this case. So you can really see uh, all this uh, information is preserved, so where the data came from, which is very important if you want to uh, go back to the, to the original source and check, is that legend? Um, 
And uh, yeah, these two are clustered together. So you can see the algorithm kind of works. Um, when we play a bit with the settings here and say, we say they have to be very different, you can see they are no longer clustered. If I say we allow a lot of similarity, you can see now we have even something more. And you can see here this big black bar. And actually, uh, I'll take this uh, question in a second. Actually, this is maybe interesting. So let's hear at the explanation why these two are clustered together. So you can see when I mouse over, you can see the tiled um, version of it. But if I right click here and right click there, and let me take the mic. I'm tempting the demo once. Yeah. The two BPI that are your duplicates. Well, that was something. Because it's loading, so the speed generation is very slow. Sometimes it doesn't finish. But what, what he's trying to say now is that. Let me take the mic back. Um, with, with those highlighted tiles, now he's saying. Um, the blah blah tiles are very similar, and now afterwards it will uh, highlight the ones that are different that you can see below. And you can already see the, the uh, uh, aspect ratio of the images is different, and also the, the size of the images is kind of different. Um, they probably need the server crash. This, this is, sorry? He popped an error code up while you were talking. Oh, okay. So it's, it's still uh, a little bit uh, shaky, but we've heard it uh, talk. Um, so it actually does talk and does explain, and you can see visually highlighted also what is going on. Um, so let's close this one and uh, turn back on everything else. And uh, now you can see dynamically things have a way too aggressive clustering here. So it worked well for that one example, but uh, let's go back to something reasonable. Fifteen. And uh, then we can say uh, 14, whatever. Uh, then we can say maybe only half of the tiles need to be similar or even less. And now you can see interactively it changes. And you can see here now, this is all this set of uh, very um, wide media items. And if we uh, look at the generated version again, so you can see for the algorithm, they're nearly the same, and if I right click, click. The two BPI items are your duplicates. Uh, I can see it, it highlights those. Probably oh, yeah, there's just some stupid error, I need to investigate. But uh, it, it's trying to say that on. From the minimum required 35 tiles were similar enough to cluster. This corresponds to 59% of all tiles. <laughs> it takes a long time to learn what is However, 5 tiles were not considered as they are either too bright <laughs> or too dark, which is a common source of clustering issues. <laughs> <There you know. laughs> um, and um, now I can see um, it's only those, so you've seen them highlighted quickly. Um, I can change that and say um, I want to have uh, a more aggressive black and white tolerance. So saying four, for example, and yeah, now it doesn't change anything still. But the higher I take that, uh, in this case, it doesn't change anything. Anything? Oh, it did. It did. Um, okay. So it just took some time to calculate. Um, so you kind of get the point. Um, what you can do with that, and um, the problem is. Because this is a very small uh, screen resolution, we're missing the bigger picture, uh, so we have to scroll a lot. Uh, but yeah, you can see here, there's really a lot of media items. And um, we can also say um, maybe we don't uh, want to consider faces, so uh, we completely switch off face detection for the clustering and so on. And uh, this is just a stupid app, so let's kill that one. <laughs> which we can do if I click this. And now it's gone for good. Um, and then, yeah, we can also see the ranking. So maybe we can play a bit with it and say, 
So first of all, let's maybe look at plasticize to get a better feeling. It's kind of boring here because this media in itself is indeed very, very um, diverse. Um, but oftentimes, it's not. Um, but maybe let's order them by recency, or let's maybe order them by... Oh, the Black, Black Hearts one, right? Yep. They have this, this Indian as a logo, um, so it kind of makes sense here. Um, all of their shares. So apparently, this one was very, was shared a lot, and um, we always have the data below here. Mm. Uh, oh, so uh, this is probably okay. So probably all of those had shares now. So <laughs> it's a kind of stupid example. Here. Uh, but if you order by likes, so shares are very very seldom. So shares don't happen a lot. But if we oops. If you look at this, likes nine, which uh, I think I'm, let's see where we are. Yeah, so only nine likes. Mm. But uh, again, we just gave it five hours, and this one is relatively young. And also, most of the media items on social networks don't get many social interactions, right? So most of us post stuff. But not every one of us is uh, Martin Zuckerberg who gets millions of replies or millions of uh, retweets if you're Justin Bieber. Um, so most of us have a small number of friends. And uh, so nine likes is already not so bad. Um, so let's see, what else do we have? Uh, maybe views, the most viewed item. In this case, this Facebook thingy. Uh, so views again, it's, it's kind of hard to get views, um, because it's, if you remember, only three social networks support views. So on Facebook we don't have that, and probably it's, uh, it's simply an unknown value for most of them. Um, so that's kind of the problem, if you want to live demo that, um, you don't really know what comes. So um, apologize, apologies for uh, the non-representativeness. Um, but if you do this, and uh, let's maybe remove this one. So now you have something relatively beautiful. And uh, now what it's missing is we want to actually see that media gallery. So it is, if we switch tabs here, and uh, now we get it. And um, this looks a little bit too wide, so we can limit it's width. Uh, I think that's only 800 times 600 here. So the projector doesn't really play well with my laptop. Um, so we can limit that. And now I can see we only fit two images. So we can say we want the images smaller. Maybe not that small. Maybe this small. Um, and then you can see already it kind of makes sense. This seems to be event-related enough. And um, again, um, it's not about absolute total recall. It's about precision here. So what you want to see here is something that you know is something that is well represented. Um, if you were ready to, uh, to use, um, what else did I write on my list? So Chicago Blackhawks completely uh, written, NHL Blackhawks. So kind of the combinations of search terms that you could come up with and which you should do if you are really a journalist working on that. Um, you can see this is very powerful, but um, in the interest of time, um, I just showed you a couple of. OK, so this is, um, if you remember, one big image, and then yeah, scroll again, sorry. One big image, and then in this case, two small images, one big again, one big, two small. Um, so this is kind of this view that gives us focal points. Um, Yeah, and then finally down there we have four images. So don't get uh, don't get uh, confused by this one. This is like that on Instagram already. So <laughs> this is this is one image. Um, and uh, what you can see now is um, there is one image too much to make it really what we call balance. Mm. Um, so you can play a bit with it and say, um, okay, so let's remove that one by reducing the size of the gallery to twenty-four. And then the last one is gone. So now it's something that is balanced. It doesn't have any, any holes. 
so it's all well filled um, with media items, and it's quite nice to look at. And because here we don't have text, cropping doesn't really matter much. But um, just to give you a feeling, you can also switch styles and switch to this view. Oh, stay strong there, so whatever that means. Um, <laughs> Actually, it would have been interesting to look at this one. Let's show that. There's a create a URL or a link to oh, yeah. the original. Strange strong. So you can see here, it uh, gets cropped. So this is kind of ugly. That's censorship. But this doesn't occur here. Does it create a hyperlink to the original content? Um, not yet. You can hit the download button and get it as a, as a bitmap dump. Um, it doesn't, uh, it's not like state conserving yet. The problem of that is, if you want to make it state conserving, you have to actually store the images, which also is kind of a copyright issue. So, um, mm -hmm. again, um, it's kind of a slippery slope. No, um, I just think it's a hyperlink. Yeah, it would be. Uh, he means the individual uh, images. Like, if you wanted to check out what's the. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they. Back to the original. Oh, sure. Yeah. They, they still have that. Yeah, they still have that. And if you create the download, oh, let's actually do that now. Let's see if that one finishes. Yeah. Uh, and you open that image, you can see you get a bitmap dump, plus you get a legend where all the sources are annotated. So you can see one, which is this one, stems from this URL. So it tries to still maintain all the, the full list of credits here. And it's not really beautiful, but I mean, it's at least not, it's considered fair use in this case. Um, all right, so let's quickly try to fix this one. Um, so for that view, maybe we make it again a bit narrower. And uh, let's change it a bit. No, something like this maybe. And then we have three too much. So we can kill them. You want the baby? So you keep the baby. Um, <laughs> all right. So I haven't shown you one last thing yet. What, yeah. What if you like to just you say I don't want this in the chair. I want this other one. That's left, I want it there. Oh, you mean reordering? Yeah. Um, it is kind of meant to be not reorderable because the order in here comes from the rank list. So you just like say delete. Um, you can delete anything. Delete one of them, and then the other one automatically. You can delete this one, which is just a highway. Go back, and then it's uh, here. But you can also, and this is what I wanted to show you now, um, you can also get into interactive mode. So, so first of all, you can delete everything here by hitting that button. So now she's gone. Cool girl. Um, but uh, you can also go into interactive mode, as I said before, like that. And then you see, as this one zooms out, everything else gets black and white and gets blurred. So our full attention now is on this one image. And then we can go back and forth, consume this, look at it, have fun with it. And, uh, and if they were videos, they would play them now? If they were videos, they would play. Yep. Um, so it's really meant to be interactively consumed. And uh, if you remember, all those media items have textual content associated with it. So someone having written something to it. So let's quickly go back to here. Uh, so here, someone has written, so don't get confused by the, by the arguments of the, of the layout here. Black Fox win, three by one lead, Stanley Cup, and so on. Um, I have this robotic voice that can talk. So in an interactive mode, once I fix the speech uh, speed issue, it will really read back in an interactive robotic voice um, what this person was saying. So it's kind of really funny to, uh, to then browse it. But it's really an interactive experience. So um, I've made it, but I like it a lot. So <laughs> it's, uh, I hope that others like it too. Um, I still need to get it a bit faster so that it's really fast enough so that you can just go like go go through it very fast, very quickly. Um, but you can see just like that, it's it's uh, quite quite fast, quite smooth. Um, it uses uh, all CSS 
free transitions and so on, translations and whatever, uh, transformation, sorry, um, some uh, WebKit filters um, that add all this like, um, yeah, beauty on top. Um, if you have a browser that doesn't support them, it will simply um, ignore it, so it won't make it black and white. But uh, if uh, you're using a recent browser, um, it will look like that, relatively attractive and beautiful and uh, nice and just fun to play with. Um, this leads me, I think, to... Oh, no, no! I wanted to show you the Wikipedia Live Monitor. Um, so, this is the system that is running right now. Um, and then you can see different sections. So this is stuff that gets edited right now. Then you can see different articles in different languages that get merged, that get edited more or less at the same time. So it's not exactly at the same time, but more or less at the same time. And uh, then you can see here article clusters that get repeated, uh, that get edited repeatedly in short intervals. And uh, you can see there's really a lot of activity on, uh, on Wikipedia right now. Um, and then. If we scroll that a bit into you. So those ones that are getting edited in short intervals, are those, does that indicate the clock version, like there's an editing war? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes, yes, but not necessarily. So edit wars are typically these kind of things where someone, so Michael Jackson, when Michael Jackson died, Wikipedia went down. Why was that? Because people said, MJ is dead. Others said, no, he isn't. Others said, yes, he is. No, he isn't. So it was ping pong, ping pong, until the Wikipedia service went down. So uh, this was one of the <laughs> most famous uh, edit wars, which is also um, yeah, the reason why uh, I will show that in a second by the call the paper MJ no more. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let's see. So what I wanted to show is, I'm not sure if we are lucky. Yeah, now we're lucky. Now we can see this is, uh, it's gone already. Here you can see it. So now this is great Indian, oh, bastard, do you pronounce it like that? Interesting. <laughs> uh, so whatever, you can see here different articles that get edited, and then below you can see what people say on social media about that thing right now. So you can see it, it's already halfway done, it's missing the last part of adding media galleries. And of course, this is this is no, no list of the breaking news candidates yet. Um, breaking news candidates are here, but we don't have any at the moment, because happy enough it's a quiet place to be on Earth right now. Um, so what I wanted to show you very quickly, so if you're interested, here is the link to the paper. If you click it, it brings you to this page where you can see the paper. So MJ No More, using concurrent <laughs> Wikipedia edit spikes with social network possibility checks for breaking news detection. So this is uh, that paper. And it's called MJ No More because it's based on work of others who have written a paper on Twitter event detection. And those guys call it Bieber no more. <laughs> <laughs> we, give, we give full credit here to, uh, to uh, the yeah, original source. And uh, if you find that fascinating, if you find that interesting, um, there is a Twitter bot that tweets whenever um, a breaking news event happens. Mm. Or there's also, if you prefer email alerts, you can click through to here. Uh, mm. yeah. And it will be brought to a Google page a Google Groups page where you can add yourself and uh, you can see here this was the last one. Let's open it quickly to see what it was about. Uh, oh. No, we're, we're done. Um, so, Tiburones Rojos de Veracruz. I'm not sure what that is, but it was started something that was important enough to be edited. So, uh, you can see here what is going on, and then let's go back. Maybe find uh, something interesting. Uh, we can search. We can say uh, Turkey. Uh, <coughs> this one. Um, Yeah, so you can see here, breaking news candidate, protests in Turkey, all the different languages that this was edited in, all the actual edits that people made, and then what people said on social networks. And you can see if you already occupied Taksim during Gezi Bakhi or whatever you pronounce it, 
So you can see this concept of using uh, Wikipedia for getting the languages it can have a huge potential. And um, yeah, I think this is time to go back to the last slide. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for listening. I hope it was fun and entertaining and also that you have learned something. Thank you.